we are very happy to host uh, Danilo Bzok, a associate professor at McGill University and the Canada CIFAR Artificial Intelligence Chair at Mila Quebec AI Institute. Um, many of us are familiar with the CIFAR data set. Danilo actually works there. Uh, and Galen Ballantyne, uh, a psychiatry resident at SUNY Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn. Uh, so almost three years ago, in what felt like a very different world, we hosted both Danilo and Galen for a session on default brain function. And that session led to hours of conversation, Zoom calls, data mining, and writing, culminating in the work that we will share with you today. So if you're here, you, you already know that MIA is a great place to learn about new methods. But this project is a testament to the fact that MIA can also be fertile ground for uh, fostering new collaborations. So in that spirit, I really encourage everyone to ask questions throughout and to stick around for the conversation at the end. So why did a seminar on default brain function lead to a research project on psychedelics? Well, uh, next slide, please. Um, as William Blake uh, put it, by default, we have closed ourselves up and we see things through chinks in our cavern. But psychedelics can open the doors of perception and reveal intense sensations, vivid imagery, and luminous entities. Can these wild, precious peak experiences teach us anything about our normal, waking, default life? Do these drugs just trigger crazy hallucinations? Or are they a powerful instrument for studying the mind? Can psychedelics do for psychiatry what the telescope did for astronomy or the microscope did for biology, as Stan Stanislav Graf has asserted? Well, to quantify and ground these profound questions, this collaboration needed to span many diverse domains of science. We will take you from natural language processing of six thousand free text subjective reports of mind-blowing experiences on 27 distinct drugs. And we'll link them to binding affinities of 40 neurotransmitters. And finally, neuroanatomically anchor it all, anchor these findings in 200 cortical brain regions. So at a high level, how to think about this project? It's very uh, analogous to the big five of personality, which was a factor analysis uh, that has been repeat, replicated on many different uh, data sets that assess different aspects of personality. And what has been found is that there are these five dominant axes on which personalities vary, openness, neuroticism, conscientiousness, et cetera. So in a similar fashion, we have derived an elite eight uh, dimensions of psychedelia. Each factor spans across semantic concepts and neuroanatomic systems and they capture evocative, compelling, and distinct aspects of the psychedelic experience. From semantics to serotonin, and from dope visuals to dopamine, we are in for a wild ride this morning. Daniela will start us off with a primer on canonical correlation analysis, which is the computational engine that powers our analysis. And then Galen will introduce us to the burgeoning field of psychedelic usage in psychiatry. After a short break at 10, we will return and I will present our computational pipeline. And then Galen will give us a tour of these elite eight components. And finally, Danilo will speak about the implications of this work and the future directions. With that, Danilo, please take it away. Thanks so much for the great introduction, Sam. <clears throat> so I have the pleasure to introduce a canonical correlation analysis and to try to situate it in the broader landscape of data analysis tools. So as I'm sure you're aware, um, there's hundreds of uh, quantitative analysis tools out there, and it can be challenging to really cleanly categorize them into coherent components. So here's a, a three-part um, view on how we can slice up the cake of data analysis tools. And that's really uh, focused on the goal. What are we actually trying to do with a particular data analysis. So we have exploration on the left, inference on the middle, and prediction on the right. So what do I mean by this? 
exploration. Um, that's really uh, the least formal or the least principled, maybe the least rigorous among the three. And um, <clears throat> this is what typically we're trying to do when we use clustering algorithms, such as k-means clustering, hierarchical clustering, db scan, and so forth, or matrix decomposition techniques, principal component analysis, common in genetics, independent component analysis, or more modern versions like, like UMAP and TISNI. And all of those, just trying to see through a lot of dimensions, find coherence patterns and data, but uh, these tools by themselves, they have more from an exploratory and descriptive flavor because they're not really trying to find statistically significant relationships or relationships that necessarily uh, have predictive value if we, if we did go and test it those relationships and, and unseen observations. Nevertheless, they're, they're one very important pillar in, in what we are trying to achieve with quantitative analysis in, in large modern data sets. In the middle, we have the inference paradigm. And this is what I uh, mean. What I mean by this is <clears throat> we're typically trying to isolate circumscribed effects in, in few or single variables. Um, so that <clears throat> is uh, maybe for this audience, a typical uh, example of um, genome-wide association studies in my view, because <clears throat> if you take Alzheimer's, some of the recent studies, they only have a few dozen genome-wide significant uh, locations. And so we really try to put the finger on the small subset of locations in the genome and then to attach substantive meaning to these very few ones. And this typically revolves around null hypothesis testing, uh, especially in 20th century biomedical analytics. It doesn't have to. Um, and it's among the three, probably the data analysis regime that is closest to causal inference. Although I'm sure you all know that is a tricky topic. So methods that are related to uh, the inference goal are TTIS, ANOVA, but also Bayesian inference and so forth. So the right, uh, rightmost uh, set of uh, click of data analysis tools is the prediction paradigm. That's closest to what's probably a lot in the media these days, machine learning, deep learning. So it's ultra inference regime in the sense that um, we are really trying to optimize classification performance, prediction accuracy above and beyond everything else. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we do not necessarily try to um, single out, interpret single model parameters. Um, I'm sure you heard that a lot of machine learning deep learning models, that's quite challenging. Um, and um, the goal is really to have highly parameterized typically black box models. Um, and um, we just try to fit any aspect of the data, even if this requires millions of parameters that no human um, may ever be able to um, interpret. So once we kind of view data analysis from these three uh, perspectives, it's, it's interesting to already situate that the, the analysis that we do is gonna be situated between the exploration and the inference paradigm. So <clears throat> the canonical correlation analysis is trying to identify um, exploratory clusters, groups, components, factors in hundreds of variables. But at the same time, it also does it in a way that it allows us to attach meaning to sets of these variables, even if, as you will see, there are tens of thousands of these dimensions that we are analyzing in a same model estimation. Okay, so our analysis is gonna be a hybrid between the exploration paradigm and the inference paradigm. Okay, so canonical correlation analysis is an interesting case because <clears throat> I show you here uh, the first uh, paper that uh, reported this technique that was in the 30s, uh, 1936, I think. And um, it has been somewhat forgotten over the decades after the publication. Maybe that's because we didn't really have large data sets um, after Second World War. Maybe it's because uh, not many people had the computational capacity to actually run canonical correlation analysis. Um, maybe it's a rough analogy to, to deep learning. We already had deep neural networks. Well, not deep, we had neural network uh, algorithms in the 80s 
90s, but they really came to fruition now that we have more compute uh, storage and so forth. Maybe there's a similar story to be told about why canonical correlation analysis and its cousins uh, become more popular over the recent years and always more domains. So what is canonical correlation analysis now? There's a number of properties that set it aside compared to the large majority of quantitative analysis tools. Um, by first approximation, it's useful to think of CCA as maybe what some people think is the most general multivariate model. I'll show you the genealogy of how CCA relates to other techniques on a later slide. But <clears throat> you can uh, think of it as um, a general case whose um, particular instances actually correspond to a lot of the analysis tools that we, that we know and love and use in, in everyday research. So on the top of the slide, you see um, in the rows that would be subjects in our case, and in the columns, um, that's, that's types of data. And as you see, there are two different data matrices because there are two high dimensional variable sets at the same time. And that's really a, a key personality trait of this particular uh, analysis. It's not just a multivariate um, pattern learning tool, but it's a doubly multivariate pattern analysis tool. So, <clears throat> That's already special, but what makes it even more special is that it's it's non-directional. Um, what do I mean by that? Uh, if you swap these two variable sets, the orange one on the left, the green one on the right, it actually is going to give you the exact same solution. So you can swap the input and output variables, what you may call them, uh, if we were working with another analysis tool. But um, that's not going to change what uh, solution you will obtain with this tool. So it's completely symmetrical. And that's not the case for the very large majority of inference and prediction tools, which is what I just explained on the previous slide. So um, in addition to symmetry, another key personality trait of this tool is that um, you are trying to compress the information. That's directly analogous uh, to singular value decomposition, uh, principal component analysis. Uh, Sam already alluded to this when you talked about the big five, because <clears throat> these types of factor techniques uh, uh, 120 years ago is exactly how we started to, so this is how we started to discover factors of um, intelligence, but later also the big five personality traits. You can think of CCA as a natural extension of PCA and SVD types of techniques to the, the doubly multivariate regime. So they do perform a low rank decomposition of the information. That's what you see in the orange circle, uh, top middle and uh, the, the green circle. So <clears throat> at the same time, um, canonical correlation analysis tries to find a simplified representation, a new coordinate system, a simpler uh, embedding in which to represent all the subject's data, but it does that in a way where it finds an optimal low rank representation for the very orange variable set on the left and the green variable set on the right because the optimization objective is actually to have the highest possible uh, linear association strength, think Pearson correlation between these two low rank representation. And that's what you see with the gray arrow that's labeled mode here. So we do <clears throat> something like two principal component analyses at the same time in a linked fashion. Um, also similar to um, principal component analysis and, and cousins is that um, we can extract several modes. Um, these modes will capture um, linearly uncorrelated patterns in the data. So the second mode is gonna explain low rank relationships between variable set uh, one on the left orange and variable set two green on the right. And um, that, so, so the second one is gonna explain aspects that have not been explained by mode two. Mode three is gonna explain actually that have not been explained by mode one or two and so forth. So that leads to some terminology on the bottom now here on the slide. 
which I wanted to foreshadow already because it's going to come back in uh, what we'll talk about over the next uh, minutes. Danilo? And that is, yes? Hi, nice to see you. It's Alex. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, ask a, a question or, or offer um, a clarification. I think it's important to note mm -hmm. here that the subjects do have to be paired on the left and right, but the variables oh, are, are do not. Yeah. Oh um, yeah, good point. Um, so the, the the subjects are are always paired, right? And but the but the variables can be completely on uh, different sets of variables on the on the left and right. Yes, absolutely. So um, let's say the first column here is um, what's going to be the first testimonial in our case, uh, but it could also be a subject. Um, so the variable sets on the left in the first row and the variables on the right they need to be from the same observation, subject testimonial. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the variable sets in orange and green on the right here, they, are, they, they should be completely different observations on the same phenomenon. Mm -hmm. This can be all types of things. Maybe I should have given uh, more examples already. So <clears throat> in principle, um, that can be, for example, um, SNP data, in orange that you try to pair with demographic information. It can be um, SNP data and functional connectivity links of how certain nodes, network nodes in the brain are coupled in a given subject. It can be structural brain morphology on the left and um, personality assessments on the right. So the charm of this technique is really is uh, how versatile it is. Does that answer the question? Yeah, no, I just, I just wanted okay. to note that the subjects are paired and the variables are not, that's all. Yeah, that's good. So, and then some terminology bottom. So that's really uh, specific to CCA that does not extrapolate to its cousins, partially the squares and so forth. So the, the low rank representation, the vectors that um, we estimate for each mode of how to project into the low rank space on the left orange, and on the right green, these vectors are called the canonical vectors. And that's what you see in panel B, um, then the second column. The projections now, so the expression in the embedding space that's emerging through the analysis, that's the canonical variate. So the canonical variate for the um, orange variable set is gonna track how strong is the expression of canonical vector for the orange part in each subject that's in each row? But you also get a canonical variant for the right side, which is in green. <clears throat> and then um, the optimization objective, which is this linear association strength, um, what CCA is optimizing for, that's what's shown in panel C here. And you can think of it uh, as um, a type of Pearson correlation of these canonical variates. So the linear projections in the embedding space in a given mode. So you have as many canonical correlation strengths as you have modes, okay? So canonical vector, canonical variate and canonical correlation. Let's kind of come back again. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So you defined the equation there, defined the first canonical correlation. And for additional canonical correlations, you would uh, restrict the maximum to be over vectors that are orthogonal to the ones already found, right? Exactly. So for, for didactic purposes, um, we usually explain that um, the first mode is established first. Um, yeah. And then the other ones uh, explain what's left. Mm -hmm. That's it could be done this way, but yeah. um, that's a different formulation. It's more well, that, that, that's the formula. variational characterization. And then there's, of course, you can also sort of define it as a, a generalized eigenvalue problem. But... Exactly. Um, but CCA itself, I, I like that you mentioned that it's it's really a member of the broad SVD family. So in reality, it's solved as a linear algebra problem. So you re-represent your data in a certain way. And at the end of the day, you, you compute singular value decomposition, which is exactly the same SVD as uh, 1900 for IQ and then for the big five later. But um, you do it in a way that takes the X inputs, if you want to call them, and Y outputs into account at the same time. 
And so in reality, you get all the modes at the same time. It's just that this is a little harder to think about this way. Yeah. And one, one last thing, sorry. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's noted here that the, uh, you have the denominators mean that the scale of the U vectors doesn't matter, but it does matter the relative scalings of the Y, uh, vary, the, the, the variables. The, the, the vari I get back to that. Yeah, okay, great. Because that's, cause that's the, next slide. the normalization question, right? Okay, great. Yeah, that's a very important one. That's a very important one. And I have just the right slide for your question. It's this slide here. Wonderful. So I'm not going to go into every single detail. This is from my machine learning lecture that I give at McGill. But just to kind of, I think it's useful to really juxtapose uh, CCA with some of the most commonly used, very similar tools in, in a lot of pockets of biomedicine. And that's partially squares. So partially squares re regression, let's say. Um, both of them have this characteristic of this doubly multivariate decomposition that I have already outlined. But there's a number of very important differences. Um, related to what Alex just said, uh, a very important one is essential loss function. That's row four here. Um, <clears throat> canonical correlation analysis is really squarely focused on optimizing the linear association between the low rank representations of both variable sets, right? And that already tells you that it cannot be directional, by the way, uh, in a certain way, which is why it is somewhat between the inference goal and the exploration goal. Partially squares instead, it also takes into account the covariation structure of each of the variable sets, the orange and the green one, at the same time, so partially squares is really pursuing a composite uh, a loss. It tries to minimize a composite loss, which with different contributions. Um, so if there's a lot of multicollinearity in the data, it's gonna change the solution and PLS uh, a lot compared to what we get with CCA. So that's what I also explain in the next row. The, the inductive bias, if you want to call it this, uh, in, in CCA, it's really a linear correlation, whereas in partially squares, we have much more of a covariance um, structure that's also being um, uh, fit and plays a big role of model estimation. So a huge question that I'm not going to go into is that um, there's an ongoing discussion whether CCA should be considered to be supervised or unsupervised. Um, but in partially squares, that's really a very broad family. There's a lot of partially squares models. And so it de really depends on the particular specification of what um, animal of PLS uh, is really used uh, for in data analysis. Um, the scaling is what we just mentioned. I'll get back to this. Um, okay, what? just one aspect here. Um, what's interesting and important to consider is that partially squares is known empirically and by math proof to yield solutions that are biased towards PCA. So that's coming in through this covariation characteristic. That means that if we did use PLS for our project, the results that we get would be much more similar to simply computing single value decomposition on one variable set and on the other variable set because the mutual correlation plays relatively less of a role. Okay, so they're rank ordered. Most important, first components are most important by construction. This is also gonna play a role. Okay, let's maybe leave it at that. Next one. So here's just a quick overview. I'm not gonna go into all the details, <clears throat> but it situates CCA again in the broader landscape of how all these analysis tools are related. Getting back to what Alex just said, <clears throat> if you look at um, the green box here, uh, sorry, the red box, uh, cherry red box in the middle here, and if you go up the arrow to partially squares, you see that the key difference is really um, how the covariance is treated. Um, <clears throat> CCA performs what's called whitening, which is a, a linear decorrelation of all the dimensions in a particular variable set, such that the covariation is, is a diagonal. So, um, and CCA imposes that structure, partially squares does, does, does not impose uh, a whitening. You can see that um, if you uh, just have 
a one-dimensional variable set, that's uh, the arrow to the top right, we are getting much closer to linear regression. So um, part of the reason why CCA is not really supervised, not really unsupervised, is because of these two high-dimensional variable sets. However, if you reduce one of them to a single dimension, it's getting much closer to the more common linear regression, generalized linear model, general linear model paradigms that we are used to. So if now again, you reduce the other variable set to also only be one dimensional, then we are much closer to Pearson correlation. That's the, the, the very top right. So just very quick, because I'm sure you're wondering, why did you just use deep learning? Uh, I'll talk about this on the, on the next slide also, but here's um, a little link already to this question. If you go from the cherry red to uh, one down, you see that if you apply a uh, enrichment function phi to one of the variable sets, which can be any variable transformation, just think about polynomials, um, you can also capture nonlinear representations in the data, even if you only use a linear latent factor model. So this can be elaborated even further. If you kernelize CCA, uh, that's very similar to kernel support vector machines. So you can rely on dot products only, work in a, in a um, higher dimensional representational space that massively enriches the information. Um, and um, that's very analogous to other kernelized techniques um, Okay, I think that's that's kind of just a quick overview. It's very closely related to a lot of techniques, but at the same time, it's also very distinct. So I'm almost done with my primer. <clears throat> Get back to the question, why did we use even more elaborate techniques? Why did we use variational autoencoders or something like that? So this empirical data slide here from a colleague, uh, um, John Murray from Yale, um, has the empirical data to show why we picked CCA. And that's that if we have 6,850 testimonials, that's the observations. That's what's usually subjects. In our case, it's testimonials. And um, we are not really in, in, in the internet scale regime. We are very far from having as many pictures as we can look at at Google, and, uh, Google Images and so forth. So we need to consider data efficiency. What you see here in panel A is the number of features in, a, in variable sets. Um, that's the dimensions in the orange and green uh, boxes. And on the, on the y-axis in panel A, we have uh, the number of observations. So, and it tracks how accurately we do identify known true effects in the data. And long story short, what it shows us is that the, the linear representational capacity of, of CCA in orange is not exhausted in tens of thousands or thousands of observations, at least according to this empirical data simulation. So um, they are representationally not exhausted. And if we had more observations, the quality of the model fit in this simulation would even be better if we had even more observations, okay? And that shows that although the technique is from the 30s, if we apply it to some of the largest data sets, uh, such as the psychedelics data sets set in our case, we are nowhere close to hitting the ceiling of how much information and patterns we can find in the data. Okay, and that concludes the primer on CCA. Great, thanks Danilo. Um, do you, was I gonna share my screen? Sure. Or we can, yeah, let's do it that way. That was the plan. Okay, okay. can everyone see? That's good, okay. perfect. Well, thank you Danilo and thanks Sam for the introduction. Um, uh, at this point, I'm going to talk kind of more broadly about uh, psychedelic drugs and psychiatry and sort of how our project fits into that whole uh, field of research. Um, so we're, as you are, I'm sure, aware, living through a sort of COVID exacerbated 
a COVID, COVID exacerbation of an underlying mental health crisis. And uh, in psychiatry, there's definitely frustration with the fact that there hasn't been really any major innovation in the field of um, psychopharmacology in the last 40 years or so. So that's why people are so excited about all this whole new class of, uh, of treatments in the form of psychedelics. And so for example, we have MDMA as a treatment for PTSD nearing FDA approval. Um, there's also on uh, the top right, here's a New England Journal of Medicine uh, trial psilocybin uh, compared against Lexapro. And it found a lot, most outcomes favored psilocybin against the standard treatment. And there's dozens of other studies with very exciting results. Uh, there's a few unique aspects of these drugs, broadly speaking. One is they only require um, a couple of dosed sessions to, in, to produce very significant large effect sizes that are durable over months rather than being dosed every day. Also, um, they, the quality of the acute drug experience appears to um, have an effect on tr the outcome. In particular, certain subset of, experience, of uh, the experiences, these kind of mystical experiences that are described, uh, un kind of dissolution of the sense of self, and um, that in particular appears to predict positive treatment outcomes. So um, now just zooming out, psychedelics, uh, there's been this exponential increase in interest since, uh, you know, there was a long period where it was, they were not um, being researched at all, basically for political reasons. And now in starting 10 years ago or so, there's been this exponential increase in interest and scholarship. Uh, now, what do we know about psychedelics? Well, they've been around for a long time. Um, people have been uh, using them from you know, indigenous shamanistic traditions where they were used for healing and rites of passage all the way uh, through antiquity and, and now today in psychedelic uh, psychiatry. Um, they've gone by a whole, a wide variety of names and the boundaries between these categories, if they're, you know, are, are contested. Um, subjectively, they're described as producing uh, vibrant kaleidoscopic imagery, uh, an intensification of emotional content. There's a sort of ineffable quality, you know, they're indescribable as one of their characteristics. Um, and there's a noetic sense of importance and meaning, which goes along with the mystical dimension of ego dissolution I mentioned earlier, but they can also be terrifying and uh, difficult and challenging. So they're wildly variable. And that variability in part depends on the set it was in the personality and biography of the person who's taking the drug and then also the setting under which it's taken. So on the right here, there's a kind of a um, description of various, uh, some of the more common psych uh, psychedelic drugs and how they compare to each other. These, uh, this is data from surveys that people take after the experience and sort of rate different aspects of their experience. And you see LSD in blue has, you know, a lot of elemental fractal imagery, same with psilocybin, but they also have this kind of experience of unity on, on the bottom here. Whereas MDMA, it peaks over here at the, the blissful state is the most pronounced aspect. And then ketamine has a lot of this disembodiment, but at the same time, there's a lot of overlap. So that each of these drugs from a phenomenological perspective has its own unique flavor, but um, they also share a lot of overlap as well. Um, now, how do these drugs work in the brain? Well, we're still figuring that out, but um, 
one of the earlier theories was uh, Aldous Huxley, who took mescaline in the 50s, and he was uh, so impressed with his experience that he, he, he said that the ordinary everyday mind is sort of like a reducing valve that compresses all the wild variability and intensity of uh, our perception of the world. And, and it compresses it down into something more useful and practical. But then when you take psychedelics, it opens the valve and all of that intensity floods in. So there is definitely some resonance between that and the um, more mo the modern brain imaging studies that have uh, gone on in the last 10 years. Uh, here's an example of, you know, uh, well, uh, you know, each of these nodes represents one specific brain region, and these are uh, connectivity patterns. And so on placebo, there's these a few well-worn pathways between brain networks. But then on the psychedelic drug, there's a, you know, there's a much um, more diverse uh, pattern of, of connectivity between the different networks and, with, and, and within them. So there's a much sort of a, a lot more, you know, interconnection between areas of the brain that normally don't talk to each other, which may reflect some of that flooding in of the uh, perce perception. Now, to be a little more specific, um, on the left, you see that, that most research has focused on the um, action at the, serotonin 2a receptor uh, you can you can see that it's expressed here in sort of the higher level association cortices in the frontal lobe and the posterior cingulate cortex on these pyramidal neurons that span the thickness of the cortical layers and when 5-HT2A is um, activated by psychedelic drugs it makes these pyramidal more, neurons more excitable which ultimately leads to this global change in brain activity um, and a more kind of entropic, more randomness in the brain. But more um, precisely, what they found is that there is a, if the brain can be divided roughly between the primary kind of bottom-up sensory uh, system and the top-down association cortex, it's thought to kind of rebalance the normal hierarchy such that there's a flood of the uh, bottom-up sensory processing and a suspension of normal bottom-down um, governance of that. And so you end up having these temporary suspension of your uh, kind of decrease in the weighting, the precision weighting of your prior beliefs about the world, which allows for novel interpretations of the world to kind of uh, come into focus and, and be cultivated, which is thought to be kind of maybe the primary mechanism by which these drugs treat uh, mental illnesses like depression or addiction, where there's kind of a rigid uh, pattern of thought and behavior. So that is um, kind of an overview of some of the leading theories on the mechanism of action. Uh, one important feature is um, the uh, sort of, there's a lot of been made of the, this phenomenon of ego dissolution. I mentioned it at the beginning and the default mode network, what the relationship is. And early on, it was um, kind of a beautiful story that people fell in love with um, where, you know, so we, cause the default mode network does to some extent it's been argued that it's sort of a neural correlate of the Freudian ego insofar as it's the region of the brain. It's a set of regions of the brain that are active when people are uh, go in introspective and start their mind is wandering, thinking about the past or the future. And the, so it, it sort of instantiates the, the um, structure of the internal self. And this is, uh, and, and since we know this structure of self does disintegrate during intense psychedelic trips, we would expect then that the neural correlate of that experience should um, be mirrored uh, as default mode network disintegration. And that was sort of uh, the theory that people latched onto. And um, it, 
it, it as it turns out, if you actually look at, um, you know, these on here on the right are these specific survey questions that people have answer, you know, you know, and they rate how, you know, the, the level of that they experience these phenomena, dissolution of their self, oneness with the universe. And then they compared that to uh, brain imaging, uh, you know, data from those same subjects. They, they tried to isolate which parts of the brain were different during these experiences of ego dissolution. And the answer appears to be more complex, involves a, a wider range of higher level association cortex changes, uh, including the default mode network, but not exclusive to it. So um, now just, I think it's important to emphasize once again, that there's this, uh, you know, the experience of the ego disintegrating is not always a, a pleasant thing. Um, it can be on the right here, you see the sort of mystical union, joyful experience of the uh, disintegration of, of normal self-structure. But then on the left, you have um, this more difficult, terrifying, um, painful experience um, that can also happen. So there's this kind of rich diversity of, uh, in all aspects of these kinds of experiences. Um, now, I mentioned before that they can be, <laughs> they're often described as ineffable, indescribable. So I wanted to give a representation, uh, sort of a visual and audio representation for you to kind of get a feeling for how people d represent these experiences. This is going to be a DMT experience, one of the more powerful uh, hallucinogenic drugs. And it'll be narrated by Terrence McKenna, who's sort of a longtime spokesman for psychedelic experiences. So I hope it comes through. Here we go. It'll be a, a minute and a half or so. You don't change. Uh, for instance, if you take ketamine, the first thing you notice, the very first thing you notice before the trip hits is you notice that you no longer are anxious about having taken ketamine. You just sort of anxiety leaves you. That means it's affecting your mind. It's doing something to the judgmental machinery. DMT doesn't lay a hand on the judgmental machinery. You, you break through into that space exactly who you were before breaking through. And the usual reaction of most people is something like, you know, and you think, God heartbeat normal pulse normal everything's normal yeah everything's normal oh god because these things are there and they're hammering at you and they come forward they're like jeweled self-dribbling basketballs and there are there are many of them and they come pounding toward you and they will stop in front of you and vibrate but then they do a very disconcerting thing, which is they jump into your body. They jump into your body and then they jump back out again. And the whole thing is going on in this very high speed mode where you're being presented with thousands of details per second and you can't get a hold on, you say, you know, my God, what's happening? And these things are saying, don't, Abandon yourself to amazement, which is exactly. Okay. Um, so that, uh, you know, it sort of captures hopefully some of the richness of these experiences. Um, and it's really remarkable that you know, a small dose of a, of a simple molecule, like any of these psychedelic drugs can, can, just really trigger such a wild transfiguration of consciousness. Um, and so here, I just want to introduce some of the different drugs. There's dozens of them. Um, and they often, so here on the bottom, the tryptamines, they have some definite resemblance to serotonin and they uh, do have bind to serotonin receptors. There's phenethylamines that are a different morphology. Mescaline is sort of the classic phenethylamine. And then there are other drugs that are 
have structurally very different sal salvinorin A, ketamine, but each of them has their own, uh, at, by virtue of their, their shape, they have their, a unique receptor affinity fingerprint. So of all the receptors in the brain, they sort of touch a unique set of them in a particular way that's characteristic of that drug. Um, and so which receptors do they touch? Well, a lot of focus has been put on the 5-HT2A receptor, as I mentioned before. And that's because if you pretreat someone with a antagonist of the 5-HT2A receptor before giving them LSD, for example, you will uh, abolish the effect. So it was, it was thought that, oh, this is kind of the psychedelic receptor, but it doesn't, first of all, appear adequate to explain um, all the differences between uh, the different drugs like psilocybin and LSD. Well, they, they have very different qualities, um, but furthermore, there's other hallucinogenic drugs like uh, ketamine, salvia, that acts through totally separate receptor systems and yet have overlapping phenomenal, phenomenological effects. So we're sort of left with a situation where we um, need to understand what are the, what are the underpinnings and the, for the whole diversity of all these experiences? What explains the difference between one drug and another? And uh, one answer is, you know, well, maybe at some of these 5-HG2A, there's some uh, conformational changes at the receptor that are unique to each drug and, and kind of act, activate a different set of downstream pathways. Maybe that's part of it, but certainly also we need to look at all the diversity of receptors that these drugs bind to. And likely that accounts for um, a lot of the differences between them. Um, so we have, you know, just sort of summing up the research at the moment, most of it is really focused on, you know, this particular set of drugs acting through the 5-HT2A receptor as it's distributed in the cortex. But we have all these other important known hallucinogenic receptor systems that are distributed in different areas of the cortex. And we have the drug families that act on them. And then along comes Ibogaine, which acts on almost all of them simultaneously and has its own unique uh, profile of subjective effects. So, uh, but then there's so many other sub, uh, subtypes and affinities. And so we have this really tangled mess of uh, receptor affinity. Um, and on the right here, Sasha Shulgin, who was a chemist who invented a lot of these, a lot of these drugs actually, he talked about how, you know, much like, a sound wave can be decomposed into the underlying harmonics that uh, really uh, form it. So too, like the each of the the, the kind of overall definition of, of a drug is gonna require a dissection into some of the underlying uh, components that, that make it up. And so that's really what we're trying to do with this project is to sort of decompose the uh, action of hallucinogenic drugs overall. But in order to do so, uh, we need some subjective data. And, you know, a lot of research mostly really uses these questionnaires and it asks questions such as, oh, what, have, give me the certainty of an encounter with ultimate reality. And then you're supposed to kind of rate that on a scale of one to five. And it, it, it really limits the scope of what can be expressed by the subject. And so that's why we've opted for uh, user-generated testimonials that are written and unconstrained. So uh, people can express in their own words the full scope of their experience. And these are, are taken from this place called Arrowid, where people for 25 years or so have been posting kind of a retro, these retrospective reports anonymously of different drug experiences. Um, and just to give you a kind of a sample of some of these reports, um, LSD, I saw colors I couldn't name, grasp the size of the universe. Psilocybin, I'm in a pool with an some kind of alien showing 
me mistakes in great detail from the past. Salvia, total madness, tearing apart the fabric of reality. MDMA, love, energy flowing through my body. DMT, wolf-like creatures with lizard heads. That was the one we saw, the DMT um, animation. Mescaline, a rainbow snake winding majestically, dancing in intricate ballet. So you can see all the nuance and texture that comes through uh, these reports. These are just tiny captions. They're pages long, each of the reports. Um, and so ultimately we've kind of aggregated for 27 different drugs uh, of interest, we've aggregated a total of 6,850 experience reports from Arrowid. And we've, for those same 27 drugs, looked at 40 different receptors and pooled from laboratory assays their affinities at those receptors. And then ultimately um, mapped the factors of correlation between those two data sets onto an atlas of the normal receptor distribution from uh, in, in the three-dimensional brain from Allen's atlas. So that's sort of just big picture. These are the, these are the ingredients of our study. And uh, ultimately just wanted to kind of emphasize how most studies are really looking at only a, one, maybe two drugs in a handful of subjects using questionnaire data with its inherent constraints. Uh, and then by contrast, we're looking at 27 different drugs through uh, over 6,000 freeform testimonials and um, doing a simultaneous analysis of the phenomenology and the affinity th with CCA as Danilo uh, outlined in order to produce this kind of phenomenal, uh, this taxonomy of different hallucinogenic experiences, these kind of underlying structures that are latent in that, uh, in, in, in across all of those molecules and all of those experiences. And so I'm gonna leave it here for now. And then uh, after the break, Sam is gonna uh, describe how we implement our um, data analysis and arrive at our, at our results. Thank you so much, Galen. Now I am going to walk us through the computational pipeline that derives this underlying structure of the psychedelic experience. And then we're gonna hand it off to Galen to walk us through the elite eight components that we have found in this study. And then finally, Danilo is gonna take it away with uh, the future implications and, and directions for this work. Okay. So we are linking two very diverse data sets in order to ground uh, this freewheeling experience of uh, psychedelic hallucination into uh, the neuroanatomy of the brain. So on one side, we have our semantic data. This is the free form text reports of people taking 27 different drugs over 6,000 different experiences. Um, and people describe in their own words uh, exactly what happened. Simultaneously, we have uh, receptor binding affinities for each of these 27 molecules. And that's visualized in the bar graph on, on the bottom. Uh, and critically, in order to link these two very diverse data sets we're gonna use the canonical correlation analysis that Danilo uh, introduced us to in the primer. And this requires a, a linking as, as Alex uh, pointed out, crucially, we have to uh, connect these data sets somehow, but because we know the molecule that each subjective uh, report is derived from, and we know the receptor affinities of those molecules, we have such a linking. Um, but the raw data that we have scraped from uh, Arrowhead needs to be uh, processed before we can get it into the format that CCA needs. So I'm gonna walk us through the semantic processing. We begin with this bag of words approach uh, where we take every testimonial and just count up the words in it. And here we have a 
sort of toy example of what this word count matrix might look like. Uh, and you see similar drugs might tend to use similar words, but the raw counts uh, have lots of problems for processing as well. Words like the that are very common will dominate such a matrix. So the natural language processing uh, community has come up with many uh, weightings to adjust for this. And one very popular uh, technique is called the term frequency inverse document frequency transform. And what this re really means is we want to adjust uh, these raw counts for how frequently a word is used within each testimonial, but also by its frequency across all of the testimonials. So words like the, while they're used very frequently in many testimonials, they're actually not informative because they're used so frequently in all of the testimonials. On the other hand, words like aliens or visuals or universe are going to be much more informative about the particular testimonials. So we want the, the weightings that are going into our uh, canonical correlation analysis to reflect that. So we go through this uh, term frequency inverse document frequency transform. And now our, our raw counts are, are adjusted to reflect uh, a sort of the overall uh, informativeness of each word in each document, okay? But we still have um, way more words than uh, testimonials. So we are in an unbalanced state and we need to reduce this structure even further. And for this, we are gonna turn to latent semantic analysis where, uh, we will take those term frequency, inverse document frequency weights and find a lower dimensional structure that captures the variance, as much of the variance as possible in a smaller span. And here we see this being animated on a uh, different uh, corpus of words, one pertaining to uh, air pollution and um, rocket travel. <laughs> Uh, and, and what you see is that similar words end up grouped together into uh, a smaller component. And those are the latent semantic components, the concepts, and they, they span multiple words. Uh, so just uh, summing up our semantic processing pipeline, we start with 6,000 testimonials and almost 70,000 unique words. Uh, and from this, we go down to uh, words that are not too common and not too rare. And we transform those with the TFIDF. And we also uh, undersample the molecules that are overrepresented in this data set because we want a sort of broad view of psychedelics at large. And then finally, through latent semantic analysis, we redu reduce from those 14,000 words down to 800 principal uh, components. These are our semantic concepts. And this will be the whole left side of our uh, canonical correlation analysis. And here we see in the screen plot that even though we're going from uh, 4,000 uh, components down to just 800, we are still retaining uh, more than half of the overall variance. So there's a lot of information left, even though we are operating in a lower dimensional space. Okay, so we have our semantic side. Now, what about our receptor side? Here, uh, each drug has its unique uh, receptor affinity profile. And to link it with our uh, semantic matrix, we simply tile each of the receptor affinity profiles so that the drug taken during the uh, subjective report is aligned with the receptor affinity of that given drug, visualized here in, on the left and on the right. And now, because we have these two very distinct data sets, one is all about concepts and, and words, uh, while the other is uh, re receptor binding affinities of uh, different molecules, these are totally different data sets, yet they are linked, which means we can use our canonical uh, correlation analysis, the CCA. 
And this uh, low dimensional structure that we derive gives us eight different orthogonal uh, dimensions that span and capture the variance of the psychedelic experience. And critically, each of these components has a semantic side and a receptor side. So they are telling us both about the, the concepts and the neuroanatomy. Why are there eight, you might ask? Well, in doing this study, we ran thousands of permutation tests where we broke this linking and we only kept the components that were statistically significant to that breaking. So that, that were destroyed by uh, shuffling, but were retained any time that the linking was uh, kept intact. And, and critically, this is a test of the, the linking between these two domains. It is not a statistical test on either one domain. So this, these, this statistical significance is telling us about the mapping from uh, semantics to receptors. Uh, and then finally, uh, using this receptor side of each canonical component and the uh, receptor densities. Is that a question from Dev? I see a hand raised, but feel free to pipe up. Otherwise, I'll just continue. Okay, so we have um, the Allen Brain Atlas has compiled uh, receptor densities via invasive uh, tissue probes that measure the gene transcription at different areas in the brain. Together with uh, uh, the Schaefer 200 region uh, brain atlas, we're able to take our receptor components and map them into the brain. Uh, so now these colors we're seeing in the brain are intrinsically linked to this semantic profile represented by the words shown in blue and red on the right. Okay. So now I'm going to take us through the interpretation of one of these uh, canonical components. And I'm going to start with not the most significant one, actually the second most significant one. And I'm choosing this one because its interpretation is just incredibly uh, clear. So these are the words associated with one extreme of this canonical component. So Looking at these words shown in blue, what do we think this component is capturing? Any ideas, any guesses? Sound, this is about sound. This is an auditory component, okay? Auditory, pitch, sound, sounds, voices, sounded, audio, voice, hearing, tinnitus, ears, hear, lower music, et cetera. Uh, and and so, just, just a very quick uh, mention, yeah. I think it's useful to kind of just say again that those are the top scoring terms from more than 14,000 candidates in the vocabulary, okay? So there are more than, there's a five digit number of these words. And <clears throat> we are really just showing the absolute extreme top scoring ones that have been nominated by CCA. And it was surprising to us that um, it's so coherent, exactly as Seven says. Yeah, so this, this is a just crystal clear uh, semantic profile. But critically, we have also a, um, a way to map back to the drugs involved. And when we do that, we see something uh, pretty particular to this component which is that one drug totally dominates the uh, landscape of, of this component. So this one drug accounts for almost all of the uh, statistical power behind this component. And what is this drug? It's DIPT, not a drug I was familiar with uh, before we started this study, but upon uh, looking at Wikipedia, we find out that this is a drug um, whose, uh, hallucinogenic properties are primarily oral. And, and this is a pretty unique drug in that respect. It, it triggers these kind of uh, changes in pitch and uh, phase in, in our hearing. Uh, 
Um, and another sort of curious finding uh, was that this, this sound uh, conceptual map almost always included the word ammonia. But it turns out ammonia is uh, needed for the synthesis of this molecule. And lots of people in their subjective reports actually were people who were synthesizing this drug for themselves and described the chemical process before describing the uh, psychedelic effects. OK, so that's our semantic landscape and the, the drug uh, mapping. We can also now go into the brain. What do we see in the brain? Where does this map to in the brain? Well, again, I'm not a neuroscientist. You'll hear from them in a, in a minute. But I can go to Wikipedia and look up uh, Broca's area. And, and that is an area long understood to be associated with auditory processing. And so this uh, highlighted area in blues and greens is showing that this component maps exactly to the regions known to uh, be involved in auditory processing in the brain. So exactly, just uh, one quick addition. Uh, so definitely um, inferior frontal gyrus, which is highlighted in red. <clears throat> but we also have in green here, uh, and a little more on the center of the circle, the primary auditory cortex, hashless gyri. So that is where auditory information from the environment reaches the cortex first. And just to kind of emphasize it, we were very surprised that we find such a specific uh, receptor experience pattern. Because just to recap, we start from freeform testimonials from a website. From there, we go to uh, receptor configurations. And then we use gene expression data from, again, a completely different data set, a completely different observation level. And the combinations of receptor importances allow us to map to the brain where a particular receptor experience pattern is preferentially expressed or related to. And it does directly point to the primary auditory cortex, which any neuroanatomy textbook is going to tell you, is where the auditory environmental information reaches the cortex first. So we were quite surprised and how well this worked, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, this was a very um, welcome finding. Okay, and just as in the, the big five analysis where we might uh, find introversion and extroversion as one axis, here these uh, components that we're discovering have two poles. So we've been looking at this one extreme uh, that clearly is uh, associated with auditory processing. What do we find on the other extreme of this pole? Well, the drugs asso uh, associated with it are MDMA and a related drug MDA. And the semantic uh, side shows um, tons of emotional words and, and words probably related to uh, MDMA ex experiences like uh, dancing and glow sticks. Um, so we are spanning from the auditory to the uh, emotional here. And putting it all together, this is a visualization of one of the components. There's a lot going on on, on this slide, but we've sort of looked at every uh, part of it uh, coming up to this. So we have both the experiential terms, the drugs involved, the receptors, and the brain regions. OK, so that was factor two. What is the dominant factor, though? What is factor one? Well, here. It is. <laughs> uh, so at one extreme, we see our friend 5-HT2A. So this is uh, already, as Galen uh, introduced, the receptor that has been most associated with the psychedelic experience, uh, deeply studied. And uh, this totally data-driven uh, pipeline reveals it as well. So, so there was no sort of cherry picking of 5-HT2A in this analysis. We simply uh, aggregated the uh, binding affinities and uh, found the, the structure that captured the most variants. And there it is uh, confirming what many already knew that 5-HT2A is an integral part of the psychedelic experience. Okay, what do we see on the semantic side? Well, the top hit is that word visuals. And what is the brain region involved? 
circled in red, we see the occipital lobe, the visual cortex. So here again, a, a very clear story linking semantics, uh, receptors, and and brain regions. But there's there's more going on. This is not like factor two where we were just laser focused on sound. What else is happening on this semantic profile? Well, you see words like nausea, sleep, effects, stomach, visual, tired, ingested, headache, and after thinking about it, it, it becomes clear that many of these words are united uh, in, that, in their perceptual uh, character. They, they are not all about uh, external sense. So many of them, visuals, auditory, are about the sensing the uh, external word, what's, what's called exteroception. But many of them are also about interoception, uh, nausea, sleep, tired, hungry, ache. Uh, so we are, we are in this one component, we, we, at this poll, we see extero and interoception being captured uh, semantically. Now, what is, so what is the opposite of this uh, sensations, both internal and external? What do we see on the other extreme? Well, here is a very compelling uh, set of semantic uh, mappings, we see words like reality, universe, exhaled, space, consciousness, breakthrough, existence, entity, earth, alien, beings, death. <laughs> so from, from this very visceral, very sensorial, very somatic, corporeal side shown in red, which is all about your, your body and, and what you're sensing right now, we, on the other extreme, see these huge words, these words about expanded uh, consciousness, about the, the very limits and, and breadth of the human experience. So, so we're going from, from a very sort of uh, earthy <laughs> human uh, bodily uh, pole to, to a mystical and uh, much larger uh, dimension. And um, with that, I'm going to give it to Galen to walk us through both this factor in a more uh, neuroscientifically grounded manner, and then to introduce the other components as well. Okay. Um, let me just get this shared and looks good. Okay, great. So yeah, as Sam introduced, uh, this was the most dominant, uh, factor in the, that we found in the data, um, in its span, you know, the, he broke it down that it has these poles that are expressed in phenomenologic terms. Or the, you can look at it through the drugs that are most associated with it, and then also, of course, the receptor profile. And then we we map this weighted blend of receptors that is associated with those particular subjective flavors to a cortex of the the uh, an atlas of the receptor expression patterns in the cortex. Just to recap, because it's a lot of <laughs> connections, but in any case, what we find, um, as Sam pointed out, is this, this uh, on, the, on the red side, uh, we find this combination of exteroceptive, like auditory visual phenomena, and then these uh, more somatic sensations, a certain time scale of kind of hours. And um, they're associated with not just 5-HT2A, although that's the most prominent, but other serotonin receptors, also D2, which is an interesting re receptor that's targeted by antipsychotics as well. And, um, and then of course we go to the other side, we have um, more abstract, wide ranging, large uh, scale terms. There's all these entities there's uh, mentioned maybe during the DMT video, the entity encounters. 
Um, and it's also just part of the mystical experience to feel in the presence of another intelligence. Um, and what, what I really want to emphasize here is this factor really captures the uh, two extremes of the hierarchy of uh, neural processing that I was alluding to earlier. And it's thought that psychedelics kind of suspend some of that uh, higher association top-down filtration of the bottom-up sensory um, signals. And so this, this really, this, uh, um, this co component really beautifully captures the two ends of that hierarchy and how their interplay and the modulation of that interplay is, is the central uh, kind of uh, neurologic underpinning for these types of experiences. Um, and so in particular uh, here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but I'm pointing to the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. This is one of the central nodes of the salience network, which along with the default mode network is um, one of the, you know, kind of lies at the higher end of the associ uh, association hierarchy. And it, um, is actually the one that's more commonly found in the studies I mentioned earlier involving ego dissolution, you know, looking for neural correlates, they often find salience network pops up. Uh, so this was really a confirmatory finding um, that made a lot of sense. Um, okay, so kind of back up here and look at our results overall, there were eight statistically significant components. Each of them have, it's sort of a vector in that space and has two poles. Um, together, they comprise a map of the sort of the, the shape of all possible hallucinogenic experiences, because none of each of these factor each of these factors cuts through all of the drugs we studied, and simultaneously examines them on the level of all the receptors and all of the experience reports. And you know, so underlying that whole rich data set, we find these structures that give shape to the the space of all you know hallucinogenic experiences. So that's kind of how I just wanted to, you know, kind of introduce the whole um, set of findings. And, um, and then I'm going to go through and just highlight some of the key, you know, aspects of, of each of the factors. Um, so for, oh, we did factor two. Okay, so factor three. Um, similar to factor two, which was had this very, you know, laser focus on auditory phenomena, factor three, you see this intent, you know, very clear uh, pattern of visual phenomena on the, on the red pole. So visuals, visual patterns, psychedelic colors, color, uh, trails, and so on. Now, these, once again, is, are associated with 5-HT2A affinity. And the expression is once again in the visual cortex. So that's definitely another kind of confirmatory uh, positive finding spanning the domains. Um, in the other poll, we see once again, kind of emotional content, depression, love, friends, lost, loved, happy. And it's associated with um, the drugs MDMA, MDA. These are known... Uh, they're called it kind of intactogens or empathogens. They induce very emotionally evocative experiences. And it's associated with uh, receptor expression in the, um, uh, the rostral anterior cingulate cortex, which is thought to be more related to emotional processing than the dorsal. Um, so that's, once again, you know, it, it, there's, there's some uh, logic to how they fit together. I'm just going to keep going through uh, more quickly so we have time for questions. Um, now, this factor four found uh, a lot of, uh, on the one hand, 
modify words describing intensity, breakthrough, energy, loaded. So it's sort of this intensity and it's associated with DMT, which as you could see, hopefully from the video is very intense. And um, on the other side, there's some uh, uh, modify words describing dissociative phenomena, reality, numb, dizzy, dream. And those are associated with uh, ketamine through the NMDA receptor. I hope you can see that on the, on the bottom right, the NMDA receptor, which is ketamine's known target. Um, so factor five, I'm having trouble with my screen here, I'm sorry. Okay, so factor five, um, once again, ketamine's featured prominently, but it sort of captures a separate dimension of ketamine experience, one of the more somatic effects uh, a lot of, uh, you know, references to comfort, discomfort, and ketamine, instead of the NMDA receptor, we see ketamine at sigma one being the dominant receptor loading for this particular phenomenological uh, dimension. Um, and then on the other side, we see all these references to naturalistic phenomena, plant, trees, sun, rain, sky, forest, and uh, mescaline is one of the top drugs. Mescaline uh, is less, in, it, it doesn't have, uh, it doesn't trigger the kind of kaleidoscopic fractal imagery the way LSD and DMT tend to. Instead, it, is, it involves a more of a kind of uh, enhancement or intensification of uh, perception while it's it more resembles the normal world. And so it's, it comes as no surprise that people would be describing their environment and how vivid it looks. Uh, under, you know, mescaline would, it makes sense that that would be a drug that would, you know, be associated with those descriptions. Um, so now factor six, honestly, this is one of my favorite factors. I think it's really um, a beautiful uh, dissection of one of the important dimensions I referenced earlier, this sort of the joy or euphoria versus terror dimension. And if you look on the left, the, there's a lot of references to relaxation, enhancement, um, interesting, euphoria, whispers. So it, there's a lot of um, positive feeling, positive emotion and uh, on the other end, you know, plant terror, death, fear, panic, vomit, surrender, uh, dying, horrible, insane. And so, you know, it's, it's obviously captures the other end of that spectrum comprised of very difficult, challenging experiences. Um, and notably, those are, those are associated with uh, 5-MeO-DMT which is known to be the most reliable dissolver of the structure of self of all the compounds. So that just popped out as well. Um, and I think, you know, th this kind of, um, this kind of, let's say, uh, dichotomy of uh, experience, it's, this captures one dimension of it, uh, factor eight, sort of captures that dichotomy on another level. It appears more of a somatic um, dimension of positive and negative. So you have this euphoria, but there's a lot more um, kind of somatic modifiers rather than uh, psychological ones. And then on the right, you, you have this same kind of awful <laughs> set of uh, descriptions, but they're you know mostly involve vomiting, cramps, uh, throwing, puke, and so on. Um, interestingly, there's a, in addition to being partitioned in a beautiful way, phenomenologically, you can also see there's a kind of very frontal and posterior uh, distribution of those receptor expression profiles in the brain. Uh, and then finally, um, this is seven, Factor seven, I want to just draw, bring your attention to Ibogaine, which is, I mentioned it before because it's unique 
in its affinity profile, but it's also unique because it is um, used to treat opioid addiction and it actually is able to uh, detox someone during the course of a one trip without giving them any with and eliminating withdrawal symptoms. So it's used um, in a variety of countries for that purpose. People go to clinics and you see references. It pulled out, you know, the algorithm found reference to um, various, you know, addiction and withdrawals, but also treatment, detox, healing. And so there's this therapeutic component associated with Ibogaine, um, in particular Sigma-2, but not just Ibogaine, these other drugs too, and uh, Sigma-2 uh, receptor, as well as NMDA, and the mu opioid receptor, which is involved in uh, opioid addiction. So anyhow, that is a quick whirlwind tour of these results. And I realized that they are um, kind of, there's just a lot of information on them. And so they're very dense. So I hope that you were able to fall, you know, kind of follow along with me through them. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. I'm going to pass it along to Danilo, who's going to talk about some of the implications of this research. Perfect. <clears throat> Sorry, let's just let's stay on these slides. Um, so this tension between the earliest uh, sensory related uh, layers of the neural processing hierarchy and these deepest layers, most sense making um, layers of the neural processing hierarchy that Gail pointed out. <clears throat> this really reminded me of Marcel Mazulam's classic paper from 1998, From Sensation to Cognition. And this is what uh, we see on this slide here. So the outer circles um, of these, um, these panels here, they represent the early auditory cortex here in blue, that's what we briefly talked about with factor two. And um, this is really where auditory environmental information hits the cortical neuronal populations first. But we also have in green in panel D, um, the visual cortex V1. This is where visual information information reaches the cortex first. And then there's a feed forward processing um, to V2, V4, where we have uh, color processing, for example, then uh, V5, which is related to motion processing. So there's a continuous elaboration of this environmental information as the processing proceeds from one neuron to the next. Because what these circuits really mean here is uh, <clears throat> it's um, how many neurons do we need to get from um, a particular part of the brain to another one. So in red, in the middle now, the deepest layers of the neural processing hierarchy, this is where we situate the large-scale networks that we have talked about a lot um, over the last minutes, um, the default mode network as well as the sales network. So they are furthest away by the metric of how many neuron switches do we need from the raw environmental information that reaches the brain, for example, through our eyes and ears. And so we know that the red parts of the brain, these, these deepest layers of the neural processing hierarchy, they have many more Breck projections actually to these earlier neural processing layers than there are forward projections. So there's something about these red neuronal populations here in Penedy that lead to what Marcel Mazulam describes as a heavily subjectively edited version of the world. So there is a continuous um, modification and refinement of how an organism perceives the environment. And it is realized through these deepest layers that are furthest away. So another interesting physiological fact is those circles also have the by far largest metabolic uh, demand. So uh, if you measure by oxygen consumption, it's these deepest layers, these recently evolved parts of the human brain that consume by far most energy. So there is something like an organized hierarchy or a balance, as we said, between these different layers of the processing hierarchy. And it's this equilibrium that is somehow perturbed by hallucinogenic drug agents. 
so how can we get some clues about the particular experiences that people describe? Um, Ms. Zulam points out that <clears throat> the complex brains that we have, we, we have just always deeper and always more elaborate processing layers. And so that's in contrast to, for example, uh, a frog, because frogs have highly rigid action perception cycles. Uh, frogs see a fly, for example, and detect it in, in similar ways, and they engage in snapping towards that bird, uh, towards that fly, in a similar way. And so there's not a lot of deep editing of what is in between the perception of the environment and the action towards the environment. In humans, however, we have all these intermediate stages, and it is this deep editing, auditing and editing towards the subjective perception of the world that is somehow altered. And that may be the reason why for thousands of years, humans have been drawn to consume hallucinogenic drugs to deliberately alter their states of consciousness. So states of consciousness are more likely to be perturbed through the deeper layers rather than the earlier layers. <clears throat> so let's get more into detail. If you can switch to the next slide. So a similar but different perspective is from um, Gregory Bujaki. Um, and he describes it in, in the following way. The simple brains, such as on the left, such as that of the frog, as I just described, is what you see in panel A. But then <clears throat> as brains became always more complex, we get closer to what we have in panel B here in the middle. There are always more computational processing layers on top of each other, and they allow to detect always more abstract phenomena in the world as relevant, and they're also able to plan actions towards them in always more abstract ways. Just think of them as mental models, strategies, how to intervene on the world. And so one way to think about why this is useful, why these expensive, costly, metabolically expensive brains um, have emerged, especially in humans, is to think that they allow to prolong a certain percept to be processed by the brain. So it's a form of prolonged environmental sensory processing. And there are all these different neuronal processing loops, which you see in B as these lines that transcend different layers of the neural processing hierarchy. And so one idea is that they enrich and annotate and propagate these sensory environmental informations again and again and again, which allows the brain to train to process these types of information in always more nuanced ways. So it's not just about uh, the input, so the sensory part of the action perception cycles, it's probably also about the action on the environment. So you can also think of these architectures as a way to have delayed action um, that is overt, so delayed real world action, it's just that the consequences of this um, prolonged processing of the environment through the layers of the neural processing hierarchy may lead to insights that only change action days, weeks, or even years later. So if you think about it this way, um, these deeper layers furthest away from the, from the action perception cycles, especially in the human brain, they may be about um, <clears throat> this continuous prediction of potential opportunities in the environment that nominates certain actions in our portfolio, how to intervene on the world. And it is this ongoing prediction machinery that is um, realized by the equilibrium between all these networks that is specifically altered um, through hallucinogenic drug experiences in a, in a mechanistically defined way. So let me give you three small examples of what this really means. One aspect is that having these um, prediction layers, it, it allows us to 
to make it possible to deal with all the sensory information that constantly reaches us in every single second and millisecond in the first place. So this is probably related to aspects like um, stereotypes, filters, so schema. There are certain ways in which a certain human has learned to perceive the world. So there's a constant um, influence on which aspects of the environment we perceive. So if you now selectively perturb especially these deeper layers of the neural processing hierarchy, you are perturbing aspects of this editing process of the, of the perception of the environment. And that is what I think we have described in a lot of the factors. Um, that is related to creativity. Um, especially uh, in this audience, it may be useful to mention that the, the discovery of the double helix of the DNA um, allegedly was really reached through the influence of hallucinogenic drug agents seven years ago. And so the idea is that these prediction machine in, in, in our heads, if we disbalance, if we destabilize it, it untethers, disengages or um, disconnects the action perception cycles from these deeper neural processing sense making machines. And that may make it possible to escape or entrench paths of how we think and lead us to insights that we maybe couldn't have otherwise because we are specifically modulating this deep editing. So that's an example <clears throat> about creativity. A second example is uh, in psychiatry. So um, pretty much all major psychiatric disorders, they are known to affect, especially these deep layers of the neural processing hierarchy. There's no single major psychiatric disorder that has not been described to show some alteration in the default mode network. And so if you take somebody who is afraid to be intoxicated, or if, you think about patients um, in psychiatry that feel persecuted by the FBI, for example. So it just makes sense that there is something that got, has gone awry with these deeper layers, these sense-making machines that edit the, the, the perception of the environment. It's not in the early visual cortex, but it's not in the early auditory cortex that there is a difference that really leads to this very complex subjective awareness, this very complex consciousness state of the impression to be persecuted. And so that may provide some clues why psychedelic drugs are showing promise in, in psychiatry because they are somehow disrupting or um, untethering again the action perception cycles from these um, disturbed processing pathways of, of the environment. So we are um, resetting, if you will, the sense-making machines in the brain. Okay, so, um, and as the last example, uh, I promised three is, I wanted to get back to time. So at the risk of getting a little philosophical, but Bujaki, uh, this is where the figure is from, believes that time and space are maybe not facts of nature, but are mostly generated by the brain itself. Um, we just agree to have watches. We agree to show up at a certain time in a certain space based on technology. That's maybe not something that really exists in the external world by itself outside of our brains. So if that is the case, then our conscious awareness that our prediction machines are generating and instantiating, they should, the time and space perception should also be perturbed by hallucinogenic drugs. And that's exactly what we, what we saw. Remember factor two uh, and three, where we had um, large weights on the dopamine receptors. Um, more specifically, we had dopamine two, four, and five, whereas dopamine subreceptor one was emphasized in the factor one. 
So <clears throat> we do confirm what we even can show in some animals that the modulation of dopamine receptors does alter the time perception for an individual. And we know, for example, that patients with schizophrenia, they do have an altered time perception. And the drugs that patients with a diagnosis of schizophrenia take, they also do act on dopamine. So those are just some elements to convince you that um, it's somehow about these deepest layers of the neural processing hierarchy. It's about their capability to continuously predict the environment using bits and snatches from the past experience to nominate actions in the future. And if we destabilize this equilibrium of how major brain networks or computational layers act with each other, this is somehow assisting the shifts in subjective experience that we see in psychedelics. Okay, next slide, last one. So very briefly, what does this mean for future directions? Um, on a critical note, I think it's fair to say that we do not know where consciousness, I'm gonna use the C word, is in the brain. We have been debating this for years and decades. There doesn't really seem to be a coherent conclusion that many or most uh, scientists agree with. We also still have trouble defining consciousness. What does this really mean for different people from different areas and different uh, lines of research? So how has conscious awareness and subjective awareness been studied in the past? That's what I tried to outline here on the bottom of the slide. On the bottom left, you have maybe some of the most concrete ways to study uh, changes in conscious awareness. And what you see there is subliminal stimulation of visual cues on a computer screen they are only shown for here 17 milliseconds. So, so fast that we do not necessarily realize that there, there was this cue on the screen. So, and by experimentally modulating how short a visual cue is presented, you can study how does this relate to neural responses in the brain? How does this relate to individual differences in behavior? However, one may wonder whether the rich texture of consciousness and the richness of all these questions and dimensions that relate to conscious awareness are really fully captured by sensory experiments of people often in, 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 a, in a very constrained setting such as a brain imaging scanner. On the other hand side, on the bottom right, we have some of the most abstract ways to study consciousness. And that's by coming up with axioms and theories in a top-down type of way um, of what aspects a conscious uh, um, entity should have. So that can be a brain or other systems. Some criticism that has been raised towards these particularly um, abstract accounts of consciousness in the brain is that how do we know we depart from the right axioms? And how can we falsify these ideas? It is often challenging to design specific experiments that lead to concrete predictions that we can then confirm or reject to make progress in refining these very abstract accounts. So, and looking at these two extremes as a final word, um, we feel that, um, the studies such as the one we presented today may make some concrete steps towards a sweet spot between the examples I gave. Because <clears throat> we do know where major neurotransmitter subtypes are located in the brain. We have reasonable knowledge about their densities and locations. We can also increasingly sample hallucinogenic drug experiences at scale, um, which we have uh, exemplified in our study. And um, <clears throat> there's an increasing adoption and interest in hallucinogenic and, and psychedelic drug drugs in society. So it's likely that they will become always more available 
and they could turn into a device for scientists to very carefully probe and examine how changes in particular neuro, neurotransmitter receptor combinations lead to distinct aspects of uh, how conscious awareness is changing. And that's especially attractive because many hallucinogenic drugs are well known not to be toxic. People do not become tolerant. They are cheap to produce or natural. Uh, so um, they do not have a lot of the inconveniences that other drugs, for example, used in psychiatry um, have. And that concludes the, the broad implications and our presentation on uh, hallucinogenic drugs and the brain.